So good morning. Good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, extremely uh, important and we hope very interesting uh, conference that we will now unfold in front of you so you'll see all the pieces of it. Um, I'm going to particularly welcome all the participants who have come from quite far, several members of the Diplomatic Corps who are here with us today, um, and uh, those who are attending the seminar on uh, Russia and international affairs that will be running parallel to this conference. Uh, all of you are here with us uh, early this morning. Welcome to you as well. So we have a very exciting uh, day ahead of us, in fact, day and a half for those who can come back tomorrow morning. Um, let me just say a few words about the conference and about the topic before I introduce our distinguished keynote speaker. Um, what is this all about? <laughs> what is uh, illiberal governance? Uh, where is it coming from? Whom does it protect? Whom does it threaten? And how does it relate to a larger theme of governance, democratic governance? Um, this investigation is part of an initiative that CEU has been conducting for the last year and a half on what we call the frontiers of democracy. I think you all know that in a famous speech uh, two years ago, the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban famously declared himself to be a champion of illiberal democracy without further definition, but he did cite as his model the governments of Russia, China, and Turkey, and Singapore, I believe, as well. So reflecting on the Hungarian Prime Minister's speech, and our geographic location here in Budapest, uh, we decided to launch a study of the meaning of democracy and its relationship to governance, and in the process, of course, to explore what might be meant by illiberal democracy and illiberal governance. This is part of a series of four major conferences that CEU is hosting internationally this year. We've had uh, the first two last fall. Uh, the first was an investigation into the problems of constitutional democracies in the West, in the United States, in the European Union, um, which we did jointly with Stanford University, who came to join us, uh, the Center for Democracy and the Rule of Law. We did a conference uh, following that on the protection of minorities in a democracy, comparing the challenges for Roma in Europe to uh, minorities, particularly African Americans in the United States. Um, we, of course, are now doing this conference on the meaning of the liberal governance. And then this June, we will have a final conference in this series on experiments and innovations in democracy. So you can see we're taking a very broad approach toward this very big topic. I think CEU is well positioned to explore these frontiers of democracy. As you all know, it was founded in 1991 at a time of great optimism about the power of democracy to overcome the legacy of totalitarianism. There were two flaws, I think, in this optimistic view, and we'll certainly be looking at them today. The first flaw was that transition doesn't inevitably lead to democracy. And the second flaw, perhaps bigger itself, uh, was that democracy itself is flawed and challenged from many directions and is a work in progress and never a clear and objective final end. I think today we're in a very different, as we know, geopolitical environment from the one that CEU was founded in uh, 25 years ago. Um, the earlier, what I would call, forces of integration, which were bringing countries and peoples and governance systems somewhat more closely together in that period in 1991, have become and have been overcome by what I would call the forces of disintegration, which is the various ways in which governance systems and nations and indeed um, localities can be overcome by a combination of conflict and decay and, and flaws. Uh, 
these two forces are still very much at work in the world. I don't suggest that the first is gone, but what we have seen recently is a weakening of constitutional democracy in Europe and the United States, political polarization, the capture um, of institutions by new oligarchies, growing inequalities, the breeding grounds for democratic discontent, and anyone who's following the American presidential race right now would see that those, uh, that discontent is at work in many respects there, as well as in Europe. We've also seen the rise of alternative models of what we're calling illiberal governance, the hollowing out of democratic institutions, control of the media by uh, political powers, uh, the elimination of checks and balances, the stimulation and manipulation of public fears in such areas as terrorism and refugees and migration, and creating thereby the circumstances for neo-authoritarians to gain control. But I think before we bury ourselves at the beginning of this conference in pessimism, let me uh, at least remind us what we all know, that I think at this very moment, the popular demand for democratic change is certainly not, uh, has not disappeared and in many, in many ways is greater than ever. It's a frustrated and pent up demand for control over one's own life or the lives of people in your communities. Uh, demand for the participation in governance uh, and demand for human rights and freedoms. And we've certainly seen this across the world in the most recent period. Um, just to mention a few locations, Tahrir Square, Taksim Park, Euromaidan, Hong Kong, Black Lives Matter in the United States, and many, many other popular movements for democratic change. And I think most of these movements, as we know, have been overcome or suppressed uh, uh, either by illiberal governance or by the forces of disintegration that I mentioned earlier, but uh, they are there. And even as the supply of healthy democracy seems to be diminishing, the demand is greater than ever. And that's very exciting. So let me just briefly outline a few of the topics that we will cover today and what we hope to accomplish in, in this conference so you get an overview at the beginning. We'll begin with a keynote speech by Ivan Krashtev, whom I will introduce in a moment. In our first panel, we'll look at the role that political parties and elections play in the development and consolidation of neo-authoritarian regimes. These regimes may have some of the characteristics of a democracy, but their power, as their power is consolidated, often democratic change becomes more and more difficult. So what are the dividing lines between liberal and illiberal democracy? I think that will be a very key element of our first panel. Our second panel will examine the relationship between religion and illiberal politics, particularly the alliance of religious movements and autocratic political movements. We can see this phenomenon across the world including in Europe and in the United States, as well as in the Middle East and Asia. Our third panel will focus on the role of the media. The media, of course, as I mentioned, can be suppressed or seduced by illiberal regimes, which often control traditional media outlets. The question is, what happens to non-traditional, new and growing and more and more important outlets, the social media and digital networks, which can circumvent illiberal regimes or be used by those who are trying to promote them. The fourth panel will look at how business and government interact in both authoritarian and democratic regimes, how do corporate oligarchies develop, how are the spoils of government used to support these oligarchies and illiberal regimes. And then our fourth panel tomorrow morning, with a very interesting panel, will analyze how illiberal governments relate to each other and to the rest of the world? What are the foreign policies of Russia, of Turkey, of Hungary, of other countries, and how are they impacting on the European Union, the Middle East, and the prospects for peace and stability in the world? So we have a large agenda ahead of us. These are some of the large, very large questions we'll ask. Clearly, we won't find all the answers. <laughs> 
uh, but we will at least, I think, have developed a clearer idea about the meaning of illiberal governance and its confrontation with democracy. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, someone who probably needs very little introduction in front of this audience, a good friend of ours and of CEU, Ivan Krashtev, who is probably one of the most thoughtful commentators on what I've just been talking about. He can challenge everything that I've said or elucidate it much more effectively than I. Ivan is the chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. He's a prolific writer and commentator on Russia, Europe, and the West, and writes a regular column of which I'm very jealous in the New York Times, a very effective column. Thank you, Yvonne, for all that you say there. I can't imagine a better person to launch this conference than Yvonne Krashev, so please join me in welcoming Yvonne to the podium. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really very grateful for the opportunity, and uh, I know that everybody is saying this when he's uh, invited to give a keynote, but there are three very simple uh, reasons for this. One is that when you speak uh, in a, such a knowledgeable audience like this one, in a certain way you are less nervous than when you speak in front of the less knowledgeable audience, because the knowledgeable people are interested in only something interesting that you have to say and they're going to dismiss the trivialities that you're going to say. While other audiences are going to be very much after your <laughs> basically trivialities. Uh, secondly, I do believe that uh, having a keynote in the beginning is great, because it means that you expect from me to come with questions and not with answers. Uh, and thirdly, because I know how much uh, John and the university have been investing intellectually and constructing these projects of the frontiers of democracy, so this is a real privilege. When I read the name of the series, Frontiers of Democracy, I was reminded by a lecture, which was quite a lot of years ago, probably 15 years ago, American political scientist Ken Jowett, who probably some of you know, was giving on a different type of borders. And he was distinguished between three type of borders. He said they're frontiers. And frontiers, he said, is like a singles bar. You go there on your own. You can have fun, even you can have sex, but there is no identity being built. And this is basically like the life in the frontier zone of the Far West. And then he said there are barricades, borders like a barricades, and he said barricade is like the Catholic marriage. They're building identities, but they're very rigid identities. As you know, Catholic marriage is a marriage without the right of divorce. You should stay where you are. Basically, it's very clear where you are. But he said for liberal democracies and for liberalism, the best type of a border is a boundary, which is kind of a civilian marriage, organized enough in order to build identity, but also with the right to divorce. So from this point of view, I do believe uh, what uh, our Iranians colleague these days called heroic flexibility. I do believe that I'll try to basically uh, discuss and try to see what is happening on these frontiers of, uh, uh, of liberal democracy. Let's start with the obvious. Obviously, the relations between democracy and liberalism is not a Catholic marriage. Divorce is possible. Uh, and you can see basically a trend which goes in different countries and basically now goes with the names that are very much commented. Donald Trump was mentioned in the United States, but you're going to see Marie Le Pen in France, you're going to see uh, some people in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, where basically, nevertheless, that we are talking about competitive democratic regimes, you have a very strong uh, uh, illiberal messages and it's very much saying to what extent democracy should be understood simply as a liberal democracy. What I find common, and now I'm talking the West and I'm going to exclude, for example, different type of populism which you can find in places like India and others, is that the major social and political actor in this transformation of democracy is something which I'm going to call the threatened majorities. All these people speak on behalf of the groups, which otherwise, basically, nevertheless, that they are perceived and defining themselves as the majority in their societies, 
they basically start to behave and have the feeling of being persecuted, which are normally typical for minorities. This has an explanation, and one of the explanations, by the way, is quite demographic. When you see some of the fears of some of these majorities, you basically have them as a fear of a demographic groups which are losing their powers, white Americans. But basically, you can see the same and very strongly expressing the fear of immigration and basically how society have been reshaped in Western Europe. This is also very much the case of Central and Eastern Europe. And I do believe this is quite important because the problem of the rejection of liberalism, which these threatened majorities comes from, is becoming to be understood very much as a rejection of globalization and cosmopolitanism understood as the major message and the center of liberalism in the way it was perceived in the last 25 years. From the point of view of these threatened majorities, the world without borders is a conspiracy between cosmopolitan elites and tribal-minded migrants. They're the ones who are interested in the open borders. And from this point of view, they start to reinterpret everything that has happened in the last 25 years. And for them, the last 25 years was really liberation, but liberation of the elites. Elites have been liberated by ideology, they have been liberated by national borders, and to be honest, they have been very much liberated also uh, by the public institutions. When you see to what extent, for example, many of the elites are sharing institutions with the other part of the population, you're going to see that most of them are not sending their kids to public schools. They're going to send them either to private school or abroad. The same is for the health system. So it's not by accident that when you talk to Bulgarians, they always want ministers in prison. And when you're asking them who of the ministers, they said anybody. Because basically, this is the institutions that we share. Uh, and I do believe this is quite important because there is something uh, very well expressed in the Russian debate. We talk about a different form of nationalization that comes with these movements. It's not nationalization of the assets. It's nationalization of the elites. Uh, and interestingly enough, if 20, 25 years ago, speaking a foreign language was a very major advantage to be elected in a high position in some of the small Central and East European countries, these days you can see a lot of people ready to vote for people like uh, some of the leaders of Mr. Kaczynski's party or here, simply for the fact that they don't speak foreign language, so for them there is not an exit strategy. Brussels does not exist for them. Uh, why I'm saying this? Because obviously it's very important to distinguish uh, between type of a critical moment where the former winners of globalization started to perceive themselves as the losers of globalization. Look at the United States, which basically was, don't forget, 10 years ago, people were going to claim that globalization is just the other name of Americanization. And see to what extent the sentiment has changed. Now none of the leading candidates of the two parties is supporting the trade agreement which President Obama has signed, a Trans-Pacific one. Neither Hillary Clinton, no Donald Trump, no Sanders, nobody. In a certain way, you have a new consensus that has emerged there. When it comes to the freedom of movement, look at Europe. With the exception of uh, Chancellor Merkel and basically part of the German debate, you're going to see that the open borders, which till yesterday has been the major distinctive feature of the European project, started to be perceived as a security threat. And this is not, I, I do believe it's always easy to try to explain this regime uh, through the personalities of uh, their their leaders, and we have a lot of talk here about Orban, <coughs> about Putin, and so on. But this type of psychoanalytical approach, which I do believe is great and very exciting, does not explain as much what is happening in society. Obviously, we're talking about something more than skillful populist leaders coming to power. Obviously, there is a much bigger trend, and this trend should be analyzed much more seriously. And even when it comes to the uh, free uh, flow of capitals and ideas, 10 years ago, any government that is going to come with the idea of a capital control is going to be called a populist government. Today, the International Monetary Fund is advocating capital controls. And when it comes to the kind of freedom of ideas, you can see that in a certain way, we have the control over the freedom of ideas in different societies, simply in different societies with basically fear different ideas. <coughs> 
the problem of the regulation of how the Islamic foundations are functioning in the European Union is a problem which is discussed, and it is discussed as a legal issue. And at the same time, basically, you know what happened with the foreign-funded uh, uh, NGOs and others, not only in Russia, but in many other places. So obviously, we have this type of a very important uh, anti-globalization moment, and this anti-globalization moment is translated as a questioning the very system of liberal democracy. Liberal democracy is perceived as a major vehicle of globalizations, and there's three things that really should be taken seriously. Now the economist is starting to come and to show that free trade, in fact, has hurt the American workers for the last decade. Uh, th there was this basic debate, and also you have some figures which are really stunning about the rise of the suicide rates among the white poor in the United States and other places. So we cannot even simply claim the normative idea that the free trade is making it is not accepted even among basically so-called non-populist intellectual elites that have been standing behind globalization. The second interesting impact of the globalization is that it's outside of changing many other things, it's totally changed the frame of comparisons. In 1981, when the University of Michigan started the World Value Surveys, there was no positive correlations between prosperity and happiness. In 1981, Nigerians were as happy as West Germans. In the last surveys, there was a quite strong positive correlations. And basically, people are as happy as their GDP predicts. What has changed? Two things have changed. First, Nigerians got television. So now they know how the West Germans live. They see their schools, they see their hospitals. Uh, uh, and uh, also, of course, with the internet, this is becoming even, uh, even stronger. I'm saying this because as a result of the globalization, the world became a village. But this village is living in the dictatorship, and this is the dictatorship of comparisons. Uh, we have been making a study in Bulgaria where nevertheless that you have a major improvement in the material well-being at least of a certain part of the population. Uh, the idea that transition was totally uh, failure, that it was lost, that we're living uh, worse than before was very popular. So the questions that we try to ask is, okay, we know why certain group of population that have been losers of transition feel like a losers, but why the winners feel like a losers? And here's the story. Because they do not compare themselves with their neighbors, they compare themselves with their kind of uh, analogs in the Western societies. Bulgarian doctor, who obviously these days lives much better than before 1989, does not compare himself with people around him. He compares with the doctors in Austria and Germany, and he's unhappy of the comparisons. I'm saying this because I do believe this type of... Uh, 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 this type of uh, anti-globalization movement explains parts of the attractiveness of the illiberal regimes. Because one thing that is common between most of the illiberal regimes, and I do believe this is why uh, Prime Minister Orban touched on something that he put together for countries that there is no political scientist that is going to put in the same box. Turkey, Russia, China, and Singapore does not have much in common with the exception of the fact that when it comes to globalization, all of them came with a very different type of arrangement around globalization, and obviously all of them have been trying to manage level of political competitiveness in order to do this. The idea of the overwhelming majorities organized in a different way has been very much uh, 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 there. So the questions that I will try to ask and probably even to uh, uh, there to suggest some answers was, okay, if this is the case, should we look at these regimes as an alternative model that has emerged, a model that can be imitated and basically the model that is going to replace liberal democracy, or should we took it as a much more a kind of a regimes that represent adjustment, but adjustment within a much broader kind of a liberal democratic age? Uh, there was now quite a strong tendency to try to make these regimes to look as kind of a very clear alternative. I do believe this is also part of our reflex from the Cold War when the Soviet Union was an alternative type of society. But even if you see some of the most 
ambitious ideological project coming from this regime, you're going to see that they themselves are not very much sure to what extent they are model and to what extent they are much more adjustment and mutation. In 2007, a famous Russian movie director and very strong loyalist to President Putin, Nikita Mikhailkov, made a film which is one of the most ambitious kind of ideological message that we got coming from Moscow. The film is called 12. It's not a bad film. It's a slightly long, but it's, it's basically an interesting movie. And ideologically, this is a very important movie because it challenges the major paradigm of liberal democracy. The movie 12 is a remake of a famous American theater performance and after movie from the 1950s. Uh, the movie was done in, uh, during the McCarthyism time, and this is one of the most kind of passionate defense of liberalism, American understanding of liberalism that you can ever imagine. It's a very simple story. I, I'm telling you because I do believe it's important for me in order to. Uh, the basically uh, uh, 12 Angry Men, which is the American original, is the story of a jury that should decide, jury of citizens that should decide on uh, uh, assassination of somebody by a Puerto Rican boy. And uh, the, the movie starts with the fact that the crime is there, they're witnesses, they're making their arguments, and almost in 30 minutes it looks as if the jury is ready to come to the consensus and to declare the guy being guilty of committing the crime. But there was one person who had a reasonable doubt and he starts asking questions. And on the basis of these questions, he starts persuading his uh, colleagues in the jury. At the end of the film, on the basis of asking these questions, they understand that the guy was innocent. And they declare his innocence. This is very important because I do believe three of the major characteristics of a liberal society have been very much there. First, exactly the reasonable doubt, the critical view, and the fact that based on the rational argument, you can change the opinion and you basically uh, can come with the proper decisions. Secondly, this commitment to, to justice and fairness. What Nikita Mikhailkov is doing, basically he is uh, uh, putting his uh, story in present-day Russia, and there is a Chechen boy that he's been accused of a similar crime, and there are 12, the jury of citizens, and like in the American uh, original, they're very much about to declare him uh, guilty, but there is one who asks a question. Uh, and then it's slightly different. It's not so much through the rational argument, but it's revoking their own experiences. But one by one, people basically started to understand that what we see is a trap, that this basically Chechen boy was trapped, and the major story is to get the real estate of his, uh, the, the apartment of his father. Till this very moment, there is no difference between the liberal narrative of the American 1950s and the Russian narrative of today. And then come the twist. And the twist is when all of them are totally agreeing that the guy is innocent, that they are just in the moment to vote him out of prison, the major character, somebody played by Nikita Mikhailkov himself and his biography very much reminding the president of the Russian Federation, coming from the same background uh, that the Russian uh, president comes, said, but I'm not going to vote for him to get out, because if he's going to be released from prison, these same people who trapped him, they're going to kill him. So if we want to keep him alive, we have two options. Either all of us are going to commit ourselves to the survival of this Chechen kid, or we should keep him in prison, because in prison at least he's going to be alive. I'm saying this because this is quite important because even Nikita Mikhailkov in his ideological exercise shows that the Russian regime is much more adjustment, impossibility of the Russia to be a liberal democracy now than an alternative that he expects others to adopt. Even in this kind of a very uh, high ideological product, his idea is we are like the Chechen boy. We cannot allow ourselves to enter this global world and basically to be destroyed there. This is why probably we're going to make a small prison for ourselves, but at least this is going to allow for the Russia to survive. I'm saying this because I find this type of understanding of some of the origins of the liberal regimes, and especially liberal democracies, very much as a survival tools.
And uh, uh, from this point, I'm just going to give you a slightly more concrete analysis of certain part of the, how the Russian political system works for this, but uh, there was a very well-known Russian political scientist who died some years ago, Dmitry Furman, whom somebody very well know here. So he, was, uh, he came with the idea of the imitation of democracy, describing Russian and post-Soviet uh, regimes. But his major argument, which I do believe is slightly neglected these days, is that imitation of democracies are not simply a cynical ploy of the elites to basically uh, exercise their power, but this is also the result of the failure of the democratization of some of these countries. And because of the failure of democratizations, living in the institutional environment of democracy, they start to make totally different use and meaning out of the institutions that have been there. So as a result of it, I'll try to talk about the elections and the difference how they basically function in some of these regimes in order to show what kind of regimes we talk about and why I don't believe that we can talk about a model but much more about the kind of adjustment regimes. Listen, out of all things that we know, and we know that sex is not love and elections are not democracy and so on, but in order to understand love, you should know something about sex. And from this point of view, in order to understand uh, democracy, you should know something about elections and how they function. If you go to the elections, elections are not simply in democracy about electing the government that is going to rule. There are three other very important functions that elections play. One is that elections in the mechanism for mobilizing the pathetic, but also to pacifying the zealots in a political system. The interesting story about elections is that, for example, you, who care a lot about who is going to be the American president, and somebody who doesn't care much, all of you have one vote. As a result of it, basically, this is a very important way to pacify society. Secondly, elections is the way to give a narrative of crisis that at the end of the day is resolved. If you listen to the way the politicians speak in the pre-election campaign, you have the feeling that the world is over. But then the election's over and the world is back. It's not as bad as that they have said. And this type of a very strange game of over-dramatization and trivialization is very much of a political cycle. And thirdly, elections is giving you the projections of the future. I know that economists very much hate the fact that politicians promise, and most of the time they promise things that they're not going to fulfill. But promise is extremely important in politics because promise gives you this future perspective in which some of the problems of today can be resolved and some of the things can be rearranged. I'm saying this because one of the most interesting story about Russian's political regime, especially in the way it functions between 2020 and 2012, is the fact how important elections are in a regime in which who is governed the country is not decided on the elections. And for me, the critical question, in a certain way, the show elections in Russia for understanding the regimes are as important as the show trials were to make sense of the Stalin's regime. The biggest question in order to understand this regime is why President Putin is rigging elections which otherwise he can win, for example, in 2004, if they were free and fair. I do believe, because there are many kind of Russians in the room, I do believe that most people are going to agree that in 2004, the President Putin has decided to have free and fair elections in Russia, he was going to win them. He was popular, he was uh, basically the, the economy. Why you are rigging the elections that you can win free and fair? And secondly, why you are rigging them in the way that everybody knows that you rig them? Because this is another part, in my view, very important of how the system works. It's not simply that basically you're manipulating elections, but it is done in a very kind of important way. My major argument is that exactly rigged elections which are not protested by the public is the very source of legitimacy of the regime. And this is why the protests of 2012 have been produced a regime change. Because the elections has a function and they have a meaning in the system different than the meaning that we see, but they have a meaning, and I'm just going to give you five meanings like this. It is through elections that the non-alternative nature of the Russian leader is displayed. Every election, the Russian voters see in front of the them, the President Putin, Mr. Zyuganov, Mr. Zhirinovsky, and probably somebody else. And you know that there is no alternative. And this, there is no alternative message is very important for the way the system is legitimizing itself. But not only this, elections is not about electing president, but elections are a very important instrument for the central government to control some of the governors and the regional levels. If you cannot get people to the voting base, 
As a result of it, presidential election can cost the life of some of the governors. So from this point of view, they're important and as an instrument for governing. And also for a country like Russia that went through the collapse of the Soviet uh, Union and where the territorial integrity of the state have been very much questioned, where the fragility is part of the personal experience of everyone. Imagine the night of the elections, in which is a kind of a celebration of the unity of the nation. All the time people saying, for example, what the Chechens are going to do, are they going to leave, are they going to do this and that, and then you see the Chechnya 95% is voting for the president. The idea of the unity is there, and you have it. And basically this is very important, especially uh, when you have this type of a disintegration moment. Plus elections are very important to distinguish between the systemic and anti-systemic opposition. I do believe that the biggest kind of struggle in Russia is not to win the elections, but to be allowed to be part of the elections, because this is a recognition that you are part of the systemic opposition. I'm saying all this because all the time, and many people know all these functions, but our major idea was that the, the uh, Kremlin is doing this because they want to imitate democracy. This is an argument that I made with a colleague of mine, uh, Stephen Holmes, in a piece. In a certain way, what they're doing is much more imitating authoritarianism. Because showing that you have total control over the political process allows you not to use caution in a political system. Because one of the interesting characteristics of most of these illiberal regimes that we talk about is a very low use of violence in a traditional way. Compare it with the traditional authoritarian regimes from the Cold War period, and you're going to see that kind of the violence and the caution that have been used is much smaller. And this is done in the way by you hinting to your power. This is why, for example, you do not need to have a mass repression. Arrest of Khodorkovsky was enough to re-invoke in the memory of the public that it can get worse. I'm saying this because this type of a regime from this point of view was quite useful uh, for the elites to consolidate their power, but I don't believe that this is something that can be imitated or being attracted and easily realized for the others. And from this point of view, China and Russia are very interesting to compare. Unfortunately, I, uh, my knowledge of China is extremely limited, but uh, just for the sake of the argument, I want to make uh, basically the claim that in the way Russia is faking democracy, China is faking communism. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and they are faking communism because in a certain way in 1989 both in Russia and in China the elites reached the consensus that the system does not work but in Soviet Union and in China they had a totally different interpretation of what works in communism and what does not uh, President Gorbachev decided that what does not work in communism is the Communist Party it's highly bureaucratic, inefficient, but what works is the social, socialist ideology. So the idea was basically restore the ideology, destroy the party. Chinese came to the totally different conclusions that if there is something which is good about communism, this was the Communist Party that has the capacity to keep the power, and what did not work very much was the socialist ideology. As a result of it, if you see the Chinese faking of communism, it is quite interesting. China, unlike Russia, has a very rigid limit in the rotation of power. At least for the moment, we know that you cannot stay for more than 10 years. One of the major advantage of a democratic system, basically the rotation of power is there. Secondly, knowing very well that part of the problem of this type of regimes is that in the absence of elections, how you're getting a relevant feedback information from the population, uh, China is basically doing something that you're not going to see in Russia. For example, labor disputes and strikes are not criminalized in China, just the opposite. You have hundreds of thousands of them. The good story about labor strikes is that they're giving authentic information about what's happening. It's not opinion polling. Uh, and this is quite important because even when you see on the level of the control of the internet, uh, I have been uh, reading and talking to colleagues who are doing China, you can be critical as much as you want to certain X to the Chinese government if you don't go personal on the first uh, figures. And you're not going to be sanctioned till the moment you want to organize a collective action about it. So they're using basically the internet for the system to collect the information about the problems of society, but you're going to be punished at the moment when you try to do something about it in an informal way. So I'm saying this because also we're talking about the quite sophisticated regimes, and from this point of view, comparing the recruitment system in Russia and in China is quite interesting. China 
preserved something of a typical career path that was typical for the Soviet system. So you have a much higher representation when it goes to the regions or professions and others. In 2011, Russian reporter uh, made a study of the 500 high position in Russia and trying to see what is the major factor that is going to determine how you can become part of this 500. There was one factor. You should have known the Russian president before he became a president. 85%, I, I hope I'm not wrong, but I do believe that it was 85% of these 500 positions have been people coming from two universities. There was nobody from Siberia in one of these. This could not happen during the Soviet times. The idea of representation was much more part of the Soviet system than this one. So why, uh, why basically I'm, I'm making these uh, arguments? I'm making these arguments in order to make, and this is going to be the last part of my, uh, of my presentations, a very simple story. When in 1989, Frank Fukuyama, who is part of the Stanford Center and who was part of the first uh, uh, seminar, uh, came with the idea of the end of history, of course, on one level, it is an idea very easy to be criticized, but he was upon something. He basically said, listen, there is no universalist model which now stands against liberal democracy. Liberal democracy is going to be perceived as the successful and the modern model of organizing political societies. As a result of it, everybody is going to try to imitate the institution's values and practices. It was too Hegelian on one level and too much State Department on the other in the way it was framed, but there was, he was upon something. Ken Jowit, which I uh, mentioned, at the same moment wrote a book in which there is a major essay called The World Without Leninism. And he basically agrees with Fukuyama on the major story. He said, beautifully said, he said, uh, normally history is a Protestant. You have a different and diverse social form, but they are Catholic moments mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in which uh, a single word becomes an institutional flesh. And 1989 was such a Catholic moment, and the liberal democracy was basically this model to be, uh, this model to be uh, implemented. But the problem and the difference between two of them, and it's also the difference of background. Uh, Ken Jowett was comparativist. He lived one year in Romania. He has been interested in the, uh, much more in the failure of modernization, like Fukuyama, who was very much interested in the promises of modernization. He said the fact that you do not have an alternative, the fact that you do not have a legitimate universalist alternative to liberal democracy does not mean that you are not going to have a resentment. Even more, it does not mean that you are not going to come with a different type of a mutation of the political regimes as a result of the real life. And I do believe this is extremely important because what we see today is, first of all, very much the rise of what he's calling the movements of rage. The lack of alternative does not mean no resentment. And secondly, if at the end of history, what is there is imitation, we should be very much interested in the resentment produced by imitation itself. And finishing, I'm just going to hint to three types of imitations that I do believe we can see. The first is the imitation and the resentment of imitation we have in a country where imitation took the form of integration, Central and Eastern Europe. One of the biggest problems, of course, was not Hungary. The biggest problem was why Poland? Why Poland, which was successful, in many, not only in macroeconomic terms. Unlike many others, Poland did well economically, but you have a modernization of society, and also you have the feeling of the collective success. Normally, when it comes to foreign policy, Poland was the on the menu, and for the first time, in a certain way, it was at the table. Uh, so from this point of view, you have all reasons to believe that this idea of success is going to basically build support for liberal democracy. At the same time, you have, on the last elections, a very strong vote for a party, which is very much a kind of a constitutional movement that challenges one of the major principles of liberal democracies. And basically, this is the check and balances. This is a party that goes after the independence of the court, which also we have in country. The central bank, they see much more as a problem. And media, and NGOs are not the most important part of it. Uh, being part of it, I know that it's good to say this, but I don't believe that the NGOs are the most important part of it. Why, and the question is, why people who otherwise are so mistrustful to their political elites are ready to delegate so much power to a single party or single leader? Why they don't fear an overpowerful executive?
And here is my hypothesis, which probably is wrong, and I'm sure that people are going to come with a better explanation. But I do believe that in the eyes of many of the people in our societies, the separation of powers works not so much. Uh, to basically control and restrain the power of the elites, but started to work as the alibi for the elites to explain why they're not doing this or that. Mm. For example, in Bulgaria, we have a problem with corruption. We didn't do well. But when you ask the government, they said, it's not us. The judges are not putting them in prison. The judges said, it's not us. It's the prosecutor office. Uh, so all this now 20 years type of a circle a free distributing blame instead of redistributing goods make people skeptical and nevertheless that normally you should expect that in a liberal society where mistrust is the default option, they're going to be afraid uh, to put so much power in one party or one person. Strangely enough, they do believe that <coughs> concentration of power is going to reduce, uh, is going to increase their capacity to keep those in power accountable. And I do believe this is one of the precedent, one of the strange impact of the diffusion of power that we see on different levels of society, also concerning market, European Union, and others. The second uh, form of imitation was the imitations that uh, I'm talking about in the case of Russia. It's very much imitation as mutation, where you're taking the institutional form and giving a totally different political logic in this. But also when you go, and this is the third form, and we have been discussing uh, part of it yesterday uh, in uh, Russian International Affairs Seminar, uh, part of the story is also how this affects the liberal order on international level. And if we say, for example, that Russia is challenging the international order, exactly what do we mean? And I do believe that strangely enough, Part of the paradox of imitation is the moment when the imitators decide that they are not imitating what they should imitate. They had the feeling that what is given to them is a kind of a wrong model, but the logic of the, the other player is totally different. So in order to be successful, they should imitate something totally different. And from this point of view, part of the Russian policy, at least in the way I do believe it is thought and justified within Russia itself is, now we're going to imitate the real West. We're going to do what they're doing. And this is quite important because unlike many people who try to explain Putin's foreign policy simply as going back to the Soviet practices, I do believe that this foreign policy is very much the result of the reverse engineering. Russia is doing foreign policy today in the way the Soviets did the television in the 1970s. You're taking, you're disassembling, and after that you're reassembling with the risk that you're going to come with something totally new. Uh, but the fact that basically we are claiming and using imitation as the instrument for delegitimation is something that is quite important, at least in my analysis. And this is why I much more prefer to see Russia as a spoiler than as a classical revisionist power. So I'm going to the very, very last point. And the very last point which I want to make was that Danny Roderick, uh, famous Harvard economist, recently with a colleague of his wrote a book on the political economy of the liberal democracy. And he said, listen, we are asking a wrong question. The wrong question is not why there are so few liberal democracies in the world. The real question is why there are liberal democracies at all. Because he said this is a very strange compilation. If liberal democracy is understood as first protection of the property rights, secondly, the right of the majorities to elect governments and to govern, but certainly also the protection of minorities and anti-discrimination and the rule of law, we know very well the powerful interests that stay behind the property rights protection. This is basically the power of those with money. You know who stays behind the rights of the majority, and this is the numbers in the political system. But why should we believe that when majority wins elections, they're going to be interested to protect the rights of the minorities? This was the question that he asked, and he's uh, doing a very interesting analysis. I do believe that this is a right question if there were no liberal democracies. Where I do believe he's wrong, and probably Fukuyama is right, is that when you have a certain type of institutional form already emerging, it starts to develop resilience of its own. The fact that you have a liberal democracy emerging, the fact that some have been imitating in one way or the other, creates a moment of its own which has an institutional inertia which allows it to survive even in the moments when it is totally challenged. So from this point of view, and this is my last sentence, the future of the liberal democracy, strangely enough, is going to be decided 
First, by the success of a big liberal democracies, places like the United States, like the European Union, to preserve the liberal nature of their regimes. If you're going to have a failure there, and if you're going to fail at the liberal order which they dominate, then the chances of liberal democracies are going to be uh, uh, much more down. And secondly, democracy has one at the end principal advantage for the new age. This is a regime that has a much better capacity to deal with dissatisfaction. And because our modern life produces dissatisfaction all the time, this is not the capacity of democracy to satisfy better than its citizens. It is their capacity to deal with dissatisfactions that makes me not as pessimistic as normally I am. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan. Um, I there are so many questions that are posed by your, uh, raised by, by your talk. Um, excellent questions, and I think they're the ones that we're going to be exploring through this conference. I, it, I have one to start, and maybe we speak five minutes and take a few more questions here. Um, is the microphone on? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I mentioned that there seems to be quite a demand for uh, participation in various parts of the world that is being um, suppressed or uh, unable to achieve results. And you concluded, I think, very effectively by saying that the dissatisfactions that are produced by democracy and by modern life actually end up making you more optimistic about the, about the pros prospects that people will demand uh, through various means uh, these kinds of changes. Um, could you just say a word or two about the various ways in which these manifestations over the last year or two or three, or depending on how far back you want to go, certainly the, the Arab countries three years ago, how, how, these, how this demand is affecting your view in the end that you're optimistic about the poss possibilities that uh, democratic change can be brought about, even if it's through illiberal means. Yeah, uh, j just uh, uh, because uh, I wrote a book on the protests called Democracy Disrupted. There is one, on one level, of course, uh, the level of empowerment of the people, their readiness to go to the street is something very interesting. It's also very interesting that people go on the street with equal easiness in democratic and non-democratic regimes. The problem with some of this type of a protest is the anti-institutional nature of their message. Basically, people go on the streets to claim, for example, we are society, we are the people. But you, in many of them, you do not have a demand for power. Uh, the interesting case, for example, I'm just going to give you, uh, I, I was very much interested how these protest movements or moments, if I want to be honest in the way I see them, have been uh, relating to, the prob to elections, critical for every democracy. Let's give you a Bulgarian case, which you're going to enjoy. But from this point of view, Bulgaria is a very kind of a PhD-friendly place. You can argue any type of <laughs> this is there. But we have a major elections in Bulgaria in 2013. There was a lot of people on the streets. Uh, and they ask elections. 70% of them ask elections. 62% of those who ask elections said that they are not going to vote on them. Uh, because they have nobody to vote for. So from this point of view, what you see, and I do believe this is one of the problems of the democratic regime, is that we have a participation that now has a problem to be translated into institutional power. To be honest, Huntington in 1968 has seen this very much as a problem of the developing world. You have a participation which we basically see a value of its own, uh, but many of these institutional uh, weaknesses of these movements, if you go beyond Greece and Spain, you're not going to see many of this kind of a movements ending up with political parties. And if you see the political parties they ended up with, this is also very interesting. Don't forget, people on the streets were believing in networks. Everything should be kind of a horizontal. We are going to discuss. And you end up with one of the most hierarchical, and I'm talking about structure, I'm not talking about ideology, very hierarchical and type of a communist party organized political uh, uh, parties like Podemos, for example, or Syriza. Uh, 
huge power concentrated uh, in the leader. For example, they said that they do not have a leaders during the M15 movement. At the same time, on the first elections in which Podemos took place, do you know what was on the ballot of Podemos? The photo of the leader. Mm. So from this point of view, this is quite interesting because there are some unintended consequences. And in places like Turkey, it was Gezi Park, which was a very, it was, by the way, a very spectacular type of a demonstration of civic activity, but it polarized society in the way that it brought the Turkey regime in the way we see it. People here better than me know what was the impact of the Moscow protests on the political regime. There was a regime change, but not exactly the regime change that many expected. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, this, and this I want to make one point because I found uh, uh, in, a, in a work of a colleague of ours from St. Petersburg University, I was very much interested how it happened that in some of the places in which the protest activity in 2012 was highest, and anti-Putin sentiment was quite strong. I mean, Moscow, St. Petersburg, support for Crimea is ours, was also very high. Uh, I talked to the Levada people a lot, and you can see very high. So how and why these translations so easily worked? And the explanation which I got was really, in my view, fascinating. The explanation was, what was the major message of the people on the street? It was about dignity. They really didn't like the way the transition of power had been arranged. This was really a low budget performance. We talked with the president and we decided that this time is going to be me and we're going to talk who is going to be else. So the middle class was really offended. So you have the dignity of the individual, we want to be respected. But it was dignity that the Russian president used as a major argument for Crimea. We want Russia to be respected. So in a certain way, the fact that you have two types of mobilizations based on dignity make it so easy for people that till yesterday have been basically against Putin decided to buy his agenda. So this is, this is my story. And uh, to make basically also the argument kind of uh, much more simple and primitive, I cannot claim that if China was a democratic country, it was going to be more effective in the way they succeeded for 30 years to have the economic results that they got. So when the regimes go well, probably for the Chinese does not make a much difference from the economic point of view, the nature of the regime. But if the crisis comes, better for the people, but better for the government to be a democratic system. Mm -hmm. When the dissatisfaction start boiling, I do believe that democracy has a much better mechanism how to do it without you destroy the system. Mm -hmm. And this is why I do believe for places like Russia, now with low oil prices, it is interesting to see how flexible the system is. Because dealing with dissatisfaction is what makes the democracies. And China, as I said, I don't know much, but I do believe that if you read basically some of the market indicators, probably China also is going to ask this question for itself. In the moment of a growing public dissatisfaction, how you are keeping political stability? Nevertheless, that there is one major difference between Russia and China I want to make. China is experimenting. They're doing this and that, they're experimenting. Russia bought from Central European transition, in my view, one of the worst messages. No experiments. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the third uh, way, go to the third world and so on and so on? We're not experimenting with anything. So from this point of view, I do believe that the flexibility of the system is critical. Thank you, Ivan. How much time do we have, Sonia, for uh, uh, questions? I, I, I don't have a calendar in front of me. What is the... We don't have any more time. I'm sorry. I didn't, that, that was not a question I asked in hopes of that answer, quite the opposite. Um, Yvonne, thank you very much. If I could ask the next uh, panel to come up and jo everyone join me in yeah. thanking Yvonne. Yeah, thank you very much. Andrew.